Hello, and welcome to this video presentation on preconception and antepartum care for the PA student. My name is Dr. Kimberly Cheatham. The objectives for this presentation are listed here. Here are some important obstetric terms that clinicians use to describe a woman based on our previous pregnancy history. The standard nomenclature of prior pregnancies includes gravidity and parity. G stands for gravidity, which is the number of times a patient has been pregnant. P stands for parity, which is the number of deliveries the patient has completed. A woman currently pregnant for the first time would be considered as a gravita 1, para 0, or G1, P0. After she delivers her baby, she will be a G1, P1. During her second pregnancy, she will be a G2, P1. Note that parity is sometimes described with four numbers. These numbers represent, in order, term deliveries, preterm deliveries, pregnancy losses before 20 weeks, and total number of living children. A woman pregnant with her second child, whose first child was delivered at term and is alive, would be a G2 P1001. Preconception care is care provided to patients to promote health and minimize risk to a future pregnancy. Any health care visit of a reproductive age woman can be treated as a preconception care visit. During a preconception visit, a patient's medical history should be updated and the clinician should review with the patient the information listed on this slide. Recommendations for preconception care include a patient discussion on future pregnancy plans, consideration of current contraceptive needs, and other preventive measures listed here. Here are some additional recommendations for preconception care. Medications taken by the patient before and during pregnancy are an important topic for consideration. Over-the-counter medicines and herbal supplements should be reviewed in addition to prescription medications. Ideally, patients who are trying to become pregnant or who are currently pregnant should not take any medications unless absolutely necessary. However, some medications are necessary and should be continued during pregnancy, such as medications for thyroid disease, seizures, and asthma. The FDA classifies medications in different risk categories based on available human or animal studies. You should be familiar with the different categories and prescribe only categories A and B if possible. Recognize that many medications are classified as risk category C by default because we do not have safety data for pregnancy. Once the patient becomes pregnant, how do we know? The diagnosis of pregnancy can be made in several different ways. Pregnancy commonly presents with easily identifiable symptoms that should prompt further investigation. Physical examination, laboratory testing, and imaging can confirm the diagnosis. Pregnancy is most commonly confirmed with a pregnancy test performed on either the urine or the serum. A pregnancy test checks for the presence of human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG, which is produced by the developing pregnancy. Pelvic ultrasound also confirms the correct location of a pregnancy in the uterus. A healthy embryo will demonstrate a visible heartbeat by five to six weeks of gestation on transvaginal ultrasound. A handheld Doppler device can also detect the sound of the fetal heartbeat by 10 to 12 weeks of gestation. Antepartum care is care provided during pregnancy to maximize patient health and minimize risk to the baby and mother. It is an important time to identify patients at risk for problems and to provide patient education in addition to ensuring fetal well-being. The major goals of early antepartum care are detailed here. Antepartum care consists of regularly scheduled visits to evaluate the mom and fetus for developing problems and to promote healthy behaviors. Because complications are most likely to occur in the third trimester, visits are scheduled more frequently toward the end of pregnancy. The information obtained at each prenatal visit is listed on this slide.
The first prenatal visit is used to collect demographic and health information from the patient, perform a physical examination, estimate the age of the pregnancy, and order prenatal laboratory tests. Important components of the patient's history are listed here. It is important to take a detailed obstetric history from your patient because health conditions that occurred in a prior pregnancy often repeat themselves in future pregnancies. After the initial patient history has been collected and reviewed, a comprehensive physical examination is performed along with the laboratory tests listed here. Special attention should be paid to the uterine size for correlation with estimated gestational age. One of the most important purposes for the initial prenatal visit is to establish correct pregnancy dating. All future management decisions depend on the gestational age of the fetus. The due date is 40 weeks from the last menstrual period. You should know how to use Nagel's rule to calculate the due date, referred to as the EDC, from the last menstrual period. If the patient's last period began on April 1, you subtract 3 months and add 7 days. In this case, it equals January 8. Ultrasound is the most precise way to estimate the due date. Ultrasound obtained in the first trimester is accurate to within 3 to 4 days. The later in pregnancy an ultrasound is obtained, the less accurate is the due date. Measurement of the uterine height from the pubic symphysis to the fundus in centimeters is a rough estimate of gestational age as well. The number of weeks pregnant roughly equals the fundal height in centimeters. For example, if you measure the fundal height at 24 centimeters, the patient is approximately 24 weeks pregnant. Fundal height is a useful measurement after 20 weeks. Ultrasound performed in the first 13 weeks of pregnancy, that is, in the first trimester, is the most accurate way to date a pregnancy. The measurement obtained is called the crown rump length, and it's accurate to within 3 to 4 days. This ultrasound image shows the pregnancy sac with dark fluid in the center of the screen. The red calipers are measuring the crown rump length of the embryo. The ultrasound machine's computer converts the length of the crown rump in millimeters to an estimated gestational age in weeks. Pregnancy is commonly referred to by trimesters. The approximate number of weeks in a trimester are described below. We also describe pregnancy by the number of weeks. Patients commonly use the term months for their pregnancy, but this word is less precise. Subsequent prenatal visits are scheduled every four weeks in the first and second trimesters and should include patient education about common pregnancy symptoms and a review of any laboratory results. First trimester screening for fetal chromosomal abnormalities is obtained between 10 and 14 weeks. We refer to this test as first trimester aneuploidy screening. It consists of an ultrasound of the fetus and blood work. Routine tests ordered during the second trimester include the quad screen for Down syndrome, neural tube defects, and trisomy 18, and a fetal anatomy ultrasound at 18 to 20 weeks. Patients also start feeling the baby's movements for the first time. This is called quickening. Testing obtained in the third trimester is listed here. Let's review some common concerns of pregnancy. Patients should consume a balanced diet, including the tips listed here. Weight gain recommendations are taken from the Institute of Medicine's 2009 report on weight gain during pregnancy. Most pregnant women can participate in a moderate exercise program as long as discomfort is avoided. The supine position should also be avoided after the first trimester. Nausea and vomiting are common in pregnancy. Women with mild symptoms who are able to stay hydrated and who do not lose weight are recommended to eat small, frequent meals, avoid nausea triggers, and try vitamin B6. If women have severe symptoms, antiemetics can be used. Back pain is another common complaint in pregnancy because of the rapid change in weight and center of gravity, leading to an exaggerated lumbar lordosis. Suggestions are listed here. Preterm labor should also be considered. 
Constipation frequently occurs because of progesterone's effect on gastrointestinal motility. Women should increase their water and fiber intake. Stool softeners can also be helpful. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, or heartburn, is an uncomfortable condition in many pregnancies. Women should eat smaller meals and avoid lying down shortly after eating. Antacids are first-line therapy. Hemorrhoids are dilated veins around the rectum. This occurs in pregnancy because of the weight of the pregnant uterus impeding blood return from the pelvis and lower extremities. Suggestions for prevention are listed here. Treatment is usually with over-the-counter hemorrhoid therapy. Leg cramps can cause severe pain in the calves. Patients should be warned not to point their toes and should stay well hydrated. Round ligament pain is lower lateral abdominal discomfort that occurs from stretching of the round ligaments with patient movement. Pain is usually sharp, associated with movement, and relieved with rest. It is a diagnosis of exclusion because a lot of conditions can cause abdominal pain in pregnancy. Braxton Hicks contractions are episodes of uterine tightening that do not lead to cervical change, so labor is not present. These contractions can still be painful, but often are not. Women commonly experience Braxton Hicks contractions irregularly, starting as early as 20 weeks in pregnancy. This concludes this video presentation on preconception and antepartum care.